All right, he's a Pro Football Hall of Famer, and I figured let's get him on, not only uh, because he has a unique perspective on Tom Brady, because he he lost to Brady in Brady's first Super Bowl win, but he also knows about second acts, and he's just a great human on the planet, and uh, also uh, called on Westwood One, the Rams win over the 49ers on Sunday and is going to call uh, Super Bowl 56 in SoFi Stadium in a couple Sundays for Westwood One. He's Kurt Warner. How are you doing, Kurt? I'm doing good, my friend. How are you? I'm doing great. What do you think? Brady's now retired. What, what, what do you, what do you oh, say about that? I mean, I think, I think like all of us as fans, you know, you're, you're kind of bummed, um, you know, because every year it's been so much fun to watch him and watch him, as you said, reinvent himself. And what is he going to do next? And, you know, everybody, I think, waiting for him to – to fall off, uh, you know, the, the flat part of the earth and, and disappear and not be able to play like he did. And he finishes with, you know, number one in so many different categories this year. And you're just like, it's, it's just unbelievable. And it's fun. And it was a part of our NFL that you said, okay, this is the one constant that we know every year is Tom Brady's going to have a chance to compete for the Super Bowl. Now, now who else is in the mix? So I think as a fan, we're all kind of bummed. Um, as a fan, as we talked about on our our you know, show the other day is that we're all very thankful. Um, you know, not very long, very often do you get a chance to, you know, witness the entirety of, of a career of, you know, what I think most of us believe is the, is the greatest football player to ever play. And, you know, as you said, I got to see it up close and personal at the beginning uh, and been able to watch it ever since uh, and been in amazement so often of, you know, what he's done. And, you know, I made the point on on our show also that, the thing about Tom Brady is that he made it seem so easy. You know, when we talk about 10 Super Bowls and we talk about winning seven and you talk about, you know, 14 championship games and, and all of this stuff that, you know, we just kind of flippantly throw around because it's Tom Brady. And, you know, then you can, you know, I, I feel for, so fortunate to have played in three Super Bowls. Drew Brees got to play in one. Aaron Rodgers has played in one. I mean, when you start to put it in perspective of how easy he made it and, and what he accomplished on the whole, uh, and, and, you know, I think in an era also, you're talking about in an era where we had other greats. You had Peyton Manning. You had Ben Brothersberger who just retired. You had, you know, Breeze and Rodgers, as I talked about. I mean, you talk about some of the greatest quarterbacks we've ever seen in this game, and it was during that era where Tom Brady did all of this. And so – you know, that, that to me as a player, when you don't understand how difficult it is to get there one time or to compete at that level consistently year in and year out, is probably what I was most in awe of with Tom Brady. Because we all sit back and go, I wish I would have had one more opportunity to do that. And he just made it look routine every year that this is where I'm going to be. I'm going to at least be in the AFC Championship game, and I'm probably going to be in the Super Bowl. And that just doesn't happen in any sport. And, you know, and again, it's the ultimate team sport. We understand that. It takes a team to win championships. But that guy and that leader that you have, that you believe in, that you believe every time you step on the field you're going to win – uh, is a difference maker. And that's why, you know, Super Bowls and, and wins get connected to quarterbacks because those guys are the difference makers. And he just did it better than everyone else. And so I'm just I'm thankful that I got to witness it. Uh, you know, if you've got to get beat by somebody in the Super Bowl, mm-hmm. you know, it's okay to say he got beat by Tom Brady. Um, and it's been, it's been a joy to watch him. And, and I feel like he's always done it the right way, too. Uh, he's always done it with class and carried himself – uh, that way, and so just uh, it's an honor to have competed against him, to watch his, to have watched his career, um, and uh, and to know him as a friend. You know what? And and there's so many ways to follow up here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go. I, I guess I got like two or three follow ups. I'm, I'm gonna take the first one here about back in the day. Um, so you know, the Super Bowl is not any normal game where you're just warming up and just chit chatting. But did you speak to Brady before when he was just a kid looking for his first? And you're that guy. Two years removed from the magic carpet ride that, by the way, is in theaters near you, an American underdog. Terrific movie. So did you have a conversation with him? Well, we spoke a little, a little bit because we played earlier that year um, in New England. And so we had played once that year. And so we spoke a little bit. You know, he kind of came on the scene similar to the way I did um, and just, you know, kind of encouraged him and said, hey, you know, you're doing a great job. Keep it up. You never know what, you know, possibilities are. I mean, you look at me, uh, but, you know, not a long conversation, but just kind of that introductory conversation, you know, with a young kid. 
uh, and then we didn't speak before the Super Bowl, uh, but talked afterwards. And, uh, you know, just one of those things that, again, at the time, you know, you're disappointed for yourself, um, you know, for whatever you can be happy for a young kid that gets the opportunity and, and does great and wins the Super Bowl, you're happy for them. But, you know, let's be honest. I mean, I, I didn't see any of this coming in that game. You know, he threw for like 150 yards and, you know, had a great drive at the end to kind of put him over the top. Um, but, you know, it wasn't this Tom Brady. And so I got a chance to kind of see that and see him win uh, as being a complimentary piece and, and just a part of a team to becoming the Tom Brady that we know that that led teams and carried teams to that point. And so, um, yeah, we had some initial, you know, simple conversations, um, but, but never with any inkling uh, of what was ahead uh, for him. Well, I mean, and, and we, we may see, you know, somebody have their career start similar to Brady's, uh, although we're still waiting to somebody to go back to back as he did three in his first four years winning it all and joe burrow has an opportunity coming up shortly to to get on that road but i don't know if we'll ever see anybody again do what he did after the age of 37 and play to 44 and look as great as doing it Uh, i wonder what you think of that knowing what you had to go through towards the end of your career Kurt. well i mean i think the one thing that i would say is that you know we've got a kind of a different breed of quarterbacks um you know, kind of taken over the NFL now, you know, the athletic quarterback, uh, the guy that can do, you know, much more than just throw the football. And, uh, you know, I've always said about guys, you know, like Breeze and, and Brady and those kind of guys like myself, um, when you play a certain way your entire career, I think it's easier to, and you still have the skill set to do that. So in other words, all of us obviously being pocket passers and not based on our athleticism. So it didn't matter if we could throw the ball a few yards less or we couldn't run the 40 quite as fast because we played it a different way. And so I always felt like guys like that had the opportunity um, to play the same way and have the same success longer in their career. Um, you know, so I think that's the first thing, and, and that's who Tom was. And he continued to get better and better at what he did. Uh, but he never had to change the way that he played. I mean, you add the rules in to the mix. Uh, obviously, that probably helped a little bit. But, you know, but, but let's be honest. I mean, it doesn't matter with all those things. You know, it came down to Tom being meticulous with how he prepared and how he worked every year and how he got his body ready. I mean, you know, the amazing thing is we actually, the year we went to the Super Bowl with the, the Cardinals was the year that he suffered his knee injury. So we played New England that year, and it was Matt Castle. And, um, you know, and outside of that one season and that crazy injury, the guy really hasn't, you know, had many issues physically whatsoever, which is so amazing to me because I remember, you know, through my career, I didn't suffer a lot of injuries, but the injuries came with like broken fingers and broken pinkies and everything on my right hand where I had to miss time and miss games. The guy just didn't miss games. And, you know, whether he was fortunate, uh, whether it, you know, plays into everything that he did off the field to, to keep himself ready. Um, I mean, just incredible to watch. I mean, you know, there was no way, you know, when I was getting into the league, Quarterbacks were retiring at 35. That was a long career. So, you know, 44, I just, with all these quarterbacks and the way they play now, I'm not sure anybody's going to be able to make it to 44 Mm. unless they can play inside the pocket. And, you know, and again, we've got guys, Joe Burrow, you mentioned it. Um, You know, we've got a number of other guys that can do that to a degree. But can they sustain that at the level that you need to to have that Tom Brady-type success? Um, will be fascinating. And and those guys that are athletic, you know, they're going to have to evolve and play the game differently if they want to come anywhere close to, uh, you know, to that age, in my opinion. Kurt Warner here uh, on the Rich Eisen Show. Um, So I I had the author Seth Wickersham on the show in hour one, Kurt, and he's been following the Patriots forever and a day. He's got a book out about their dynasty. And I asked him about Brady's decision to retire now, and how I'm kind of, I was kind of surprised by it for many reasons because he's been so terrific. But the fact is that, you know, he, he, he's not giving it one more try to make sure he can end it on a win, right, with a Super Bowl win. And here was his response, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the other side. Check it out. There was a moment that I was, at his, I was in his living room and we were talking, and this was maybe seven years ago. It was before the sort of rest of the dynasty, which – 
not only the Patriots, but really the Tom Brady dynasty kind of was reclamated. And he was telling me about, they had just lost to the Ravens in the playoffs, and he told me that Kurt Warner had sent him a text after the game saying, like, being the best doesn't mean you always win. It just means you win more than anybody else. And that text really meant a lot to him because it, it spoke to his essence in a way that very few messages could. It, yes, it's always about winning, but it was often in failure that he found successes. And, you know, the, the people, there's people who argued he'd never leave New England after throwing a pick six on his final throw against the Titans. And there's people who'd argue he'd never go out losing to the Los Angeles Rams in the playoffs. But, you know, that was it, – it always misread him just a little bit. I think that what he prided himself on as much as anything is this kind of genius he had of refusing to concede to anyone else's idea of the inevitable or of reality in that regard. What do you think of that, Tirk? How about that? Well, I mean, you know, I think it's something that we all have to come to grips with is, you know, so many of the guys that play at this level are used to winning and they're used to being the best at what they do. And most times they feel like those two things are synonymous. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's also the ultimate team game. And so I tell people all the time, sometimes the the greatest thing about being a football player is that it's a team game and you get to celebrate those moments with 52 other guys. And then sometimes the worst thing about football is that it's a team game because it takes everybody. and, And, you know, sometimes other facets can let you down. And so I think we all have to come to a realization of what it means to be our best. And being our best doesn't always mean that we win on the scoreboard and that we have more points than the other team. And that gets lost, I think, too often in society as a whole and, you know, just in sport in general, that it's all about how many points you have on the board. And, you know, and, you know when I text that and Tom and I have a great relationship and we would, you know, text back and forth all the time, but really it was just, just understand who you are and what you've done and don't ever, you know, you know, feel like a a season can't be a success when you don't finish winning a Super Bowl. And, um, you know, so I love that, you know, you can have those conversations with guys like that that are the greatest of all time. Um, and you can still impress upon them things that you've learned throughout your time and throughout your journey, because that to me is what it's all about. All of us evolving and coming to a better understanding of what it means to try to be our best on a daily basis, and then being able to step away and be comfortable that we were that and that we did what we needed to do uh, to become the best version of ourselves, which is what I believe Tom Brady's always tried to do. Kurt Warner here uh, on the Rich Eisen Show. <clears throat> Before I let you go, uh, let's talk about the film that you've seen from Championship Weekend. Um, and um, and then obviously the what you saw with your own two eyes calling the uh, NFC Championship game, starting with the AFC Championship. I know you've been watching tape on that one. Uh, what happened to that Chiefs offense in that game, Kurt? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, so many things, you know, go on in the course of a game, and, you know, everybody saw the points on the board early in the game. And sometimes when I watch film, Rich, I'll watch and say, okay, did, did something happen earlier in a game? that maybe leads to something not happening happening as well later in the game. And what do I mean by that? You know, in that game, Patrick Mahomes had, um, you know, a couple touchdowns in the first half where it was just unbelievable. Scramble plays by him, by in time, and then he makes these great throws and, and they get two touchdowns out of it. Later in the game, they had an opportunity, a couple opportunities in the red zone um, where if Patrick, I think, just reads the, the play the way that he normally would read it, uh, I think he throws a couple touchdowns there. And we may mm. be talking about them in the Super Bowl. Um, and one specifically, he got caught up kind of bouncing in the pocket, almost like I'm not really reading anything. I'm just buying time enough so I can go and scramble and make a play. And, and so I think sometimes we fall into modes where things have worked earlier in the game and we try to force something later in the game. Um, you know, the interception that he threw off of that, you know, the RPO, the tip to the defensive lineman, uh, it was actually an RPO that normally you would read the other side. You're reading the, the right defensive end, and if he bites down, you throw it out the right-hand side because they've voided that area. 
for some reason, Patrick decided to, to go and throw it to the left-hand side away from his read um, and, and throw it to the combination, the quick combination that was out the left instead of the right, which is just, again, I know it's happened to him before, and he's seen a look, and it's worked out. But instead of just kind of playing the play, um, you know, he tried to make another play, and, and, and it worked out against them. And so um, that, to me, is what kind of happened, is that everything was going right, and they were making every play early on. It felt like they were invincible. So starting with that last play at the end of the, the first half, which I'm still kind of confused by the play call, mm. but, you know, I think it was Patrick saying, man, everything else is working, so let me just throw it to Tyreek, and he'll make it work because we're invincible right now. And then after he makes that throw, it's like, oh, wait a second. That wasn't the right decision. And he got a little more tentative. And, you know, I think he started thinking about the game more than just reacting and playing. Um, and then things just didn't work out for them in the second half. And the momentum switched. Um, and you give credit to the other side for making the plays that were available in front of them to make, whether it was defensively or offensively. Joe Burrow making some key plays really with his legs that we talked about on our show is that he's kind of sneaky good at you know buying time in the pocket and, and avoiding sacks in the pocket. And even if he gains three or four yards, it's a positive instead of a negative. And that was really kind of the, you know, the story of the second half, in my opinion. Um, you know, the, I thought Cincinnati played good. Um, but I thought, you know, Kansas City just didn't do what they normally do. And, and, you know, Patrick was the first one to kind of say, hey, some of that stuff's on me, that Patrick didn't play his game the second half. And, and when you're playing against good teams and you allow some of those things and, to go against you, man, it, it, it's tough to win. And that's what we've seen throughout these playoffs is that all these games are close. Okay, who's going to make that one mistake? Or who's going to do something that's uncharacteristic of themselves, give the other team a chance, and then the other team – all of these teams have the chance to capitalize on it. And then what's the story of the NFC Championship game? Uh, I mean, I think the NFC Championship game, um, you know, I think it was just a tough-fought football game mm-hmm. where, again, there were some missed opportunities by the Rams in that game that kept the 49ers around. I know everybody's killing Jimmy G. I thought Jimmy G played one of his best games. Um, but we're going to point out, you know, a couple things. Obviously, that the miss pass in the first drive, which I know he'd want back, and then the one to you Kittle. Know, You're talking about the one to Kittle. Yeah, the one to Kittle. Oh, he was uh, so wide open. Third down. He was um, so wide open. Missed that. That could have gone for six. Yeah. Um, and then obviously the last one, where I mean, he had to try to do something. He's just trying to make a play, so it's not you know fourth and forty. Right. Um, and the ball gets tipped up, and, and you know, but I thought Jimmy G played a really, really good game, uh, making the right decision uh, most of the time. Um, but, you know, but the Rams, to me, were the better team. Matthew Stafford is playing great football. Um, you know, made the one mistake in the red zone that turned into an interception or, you know, who knows how that game goes. But Jalen Ramsey has two opportunities to catch an interception that possibly finished that game uh, before that. We're all talking about Tart's interception and the one, you know, or one of the two mistakes that, that Stafford made. Um, but, you know, Jalen Ramsey had a chance to finish that game. I just think the better team were, were the Rams. 49ers, you know, did what they needed to do and kept it close like they had up to this point uh, in all their games, but just weren't able to finish. And I give more credit to the Rams. Offensively, what they did, three straight drives in the fourth quarter to put points on the board. You tip your hat to them. Cooper Cup and Stafford were incredible. OBJ was great. And then the defense did what you brought all those guys here to do is you got a lead at the end, finish it for us. And they went out and they finished it for them. And so uh, a good football game on that side, uh, but, again, I, I believe the better team won, um, and, uh, you know, the Rams made enough plays to, to get a, a tight victory. Well, uh, but, you know, appreciate the time here, Kurt, uh, rolling with the punches with the show today and we and, and getting you on. I um, uh, hope to get you on maybe sometime next week in the lead-up to, to know what you think about the matchup, um, and I appreciate the two cents. I thought it was pretty cool to hear that story about – your text to Brady, you know, sometimes you send a text to somebody, you don't know what, it, you know, what it means or how it lands or something like that. And here, he, here we are years later on the day of his retirement and um, somebody who knows Brady pretty well is saying that meant a lot to him. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, I mean, that, that stuff is cool. Cause again, you're, you know, always just trying to build relationships and uh, you know, different things along the way. And you never know, you never know how it's going to play out. Exactly. And since, especially since on game day morning, you're known as somebody who does not get his text returned by quarterbacks. Um, so I figured I should. One time, know. one time. And I get that. And, 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 it's a and reputation. That becomes, 
that becomes how you you guys remember me. American okay. underdog in theaters near you. How's that? Did I make up for it right now? Okay, I'll, everybody, I'll go, see, everybody go see Kurt's movie. It's a beautiful <laughs> movie. Kurt and Brenda's movie. My bad. Good to see uh, chat with you, Kurt. We'll do this again you next too, buddy. week. Thanks, man. It's all the right. best. That's the one of the best of all time, right there. And a fantastic friend, uh, Kurt Warner, right here.